uh, Jesus didn't have a problem with people that's in the streets. He had a problem with religious people. How can I help anybody when I'm not even when I was not even able to help my own son? I would never do that. I would never do that. And I became that in a matter of minutes when they took my pain pills away. And I said, I'm not where I want to be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. Ugh. This is Faith in Your Recovery. I am Randy Davis. Welcome to the battle. Welcome to the battle indeed. We're glad you're with us. We look forward to sharing with you today, but we're just excited to have another opportunity to tell the story of of what was once dark turned light, which was once uh, nothing but ugly, turned much more beautiful. And we know you can relate to that story because you may have one of your own. And we'd love to hear it here at Faith in Your Recovery. You can reach us by simply emailing podcast at ablbh.org. Go ahead. Let us know what our program's meant to you. Give us some thoughts and ideas. Get a hold of us. We'd love to get in contact with you. We can do this remote unless you're local. We'd love to have you face-to-face. But between now and then, our rock star of recovery today is Heather Matthews. Welcome, Heather. Hi, my name is Heather Matthews. Hey, good to have you with us. We're excited that you're here. Heather, are you from from here in Anderson? Has this been your home most of your life? Um, it was till I was about eleven and then I moved to Kentucky for nine years and then Fort Lauderdale for nine and then I came back here to Anderson, Indiana to take care of my mother when she was dying. So how long ago was that, Heather? How long have you been back? Nine years. Nine years, so a period of nines in there, okay? (laughs) A lot of nines, got a pattern going on. All right. Listen, we want to hear your story, so let's back up to those early years of your life. Tell us what growing up was like for you. Well, first off, I grew up in a home that I didn't ask for. Um, My parents were addicts, and their demons became my demons. Um, The cops were always at my house. Um, I would hide underneath a table when they would fight. What, what were their, you mentioned they had their addictions to what? Was it alcohol, was it drugs? My dad liked cocaine and alcohol, and my mom was a garbage can. She would take anything. So it didn't matter. There was going to be a struggle there, and you had to deal with that. And the only way you knew was to hide under the table was that for safety or just so you could close off that shouting, that battling? Well, Randy, under, I would hide under that table um, because on the wall there was a light of Jesus. It was plugged in, um, and I would hide under that table, and I felt like it was a sense of security. Okay, okay. And were you able to see that light from under the table so you could focus on that instead of what was happening around you? That's correct. Yeah. How old were you at that time? It started at five until I was about eight. Okay. And what caused it to stop when you were eight? My parents split up. Okay. Okay. So uh, what happened with you at that time? Who did you go with? Where did you stay? Was it in between both? How did that play? Well, um, my father got custody of me and my sister. Um is your sister older or younger? She's my baby sister. Okay. Um, we lived with him for a while, and um, a couple years later, I ended up wanting to move with my mom to Kentucky to take care of her parents that were not, that was dying. Um, but throughout all of it, the whole time I was looking for love, um, and I never got it. So at 11... I went through my mom's room and I went through my dad's bedrooms and I wanted to know what drugs they were on because I figured I could be loved if I started using what they were using. Um, You would fit in that way. Was that part of the thinking at that time? Yeah, and I thought since what they were doing was in me, then they had to love me, Um, which didn't work. Okay. Okay, so what became of that? Let's go from nine years old on up then. Uh, you <clears throat> moved to Kentucky there. Yes. And you said earlier that lasted about nine years, mm-hmm. right? Yes. What was life like during that time 
being with your mom and your grandparents? Um, it was hard. I was grateful to be able to be with my mom's parents. That's when my addiction um, really grew because in Kentucky there's not a lot to do. Um, so we would just have a campfire and everybody got drunk and high. That was normal. So I get to drunk. What was the high? What was the drug of choice or availability, whatever the case was? Or did it matter? Cocaine and Oxycontin. Okay. Okay. Was it pretty easy to get a hold of where you were? Yes. Okay. Okay. So how long did that continue, that partying aspect of your life? Um, up till I was about 20 years old. So that's how many years there? It's nine total. Okay. And uh, was it still those three things, the alcohol, the Oxycontin, and what else did you say? Heroin? No, cocaine, um, cocaine and cocaine. Oxycontin were my drugs of choice. Yeah, okay. And so that was nine years of that, which means you had to have a pretty rough going through school, socializing, and everything else, and probably led you into a group that wasn't going to help you a lot. Um, no, it did not. And during that time, I also found out um, that I was molested, and then some things happened to me that I had blocked out. Um, and I was part of a pill mill that would go to Florida um, and get pick up pills and come back, you know, and cross state lines. And I got arrested down there, um, and that day... It was, I call it the angel with wings because it saved my life. How is that? First off, let me back up a little bit here, okay? Okay. You say you came to the recognition that you'd been abused. Mm -hmm. How were you able to come to that recognition, that understanding? Um, by seeing a doctor okay. for thing, uh, female things. Okay. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. We're not mm -hmm. going to go into details, but that helps everybody understand. So you became a part of that pill mill, and you were a part of running back and forth with the pills, but you got stopped there in Florida, yes? Fort Lauderdale, to be exact. All right, all right. What became of that, those moments? How did that play out? Well, we, we got pulled over. The DEA had um, put a hold on the medication, and when you spend a lot of money to get people down there, you're not going to leave until you get product you pay you know what you came for so we were there about a week um the dea released them we went to leave and it wasn't too long after that we were pulled over okay and what happened at that point they got everybody out of the van except for me because i had a dog and um once they were searched they seized what they had and they got me out not once, but twice, and I had a mini stroke in my hand because I had medication in my hand. And I had a mini stroke, and it took a minute for my hand to open. I now know that that was God, but that's how it went. And then they, I, they handcuffed me and put me in a car. Take you off to jail at that time? How old were you? 18-ish? 20. 20. You were 20 at that time. Okay. So this was pretty near the end of that run and that time there. So uh, how, what were kind of charges came about? How long possession. did you serve? Um, it was just possession charge. My mom and my older sister were with me down there, and they posted my bell and left me. So when I got out, I was on the streets of Fort Lauderdale for two weeks. Homeless. Yes. Yes. How'd you survive that, Heather? Uh, how did you make it through? I would just walk around, and people would offer me money, and I would tell them I have a home, because um, it didn't. Really, I, it took a minute to sink in that the situation that was going on. You had a home, but you didn't have access yeah. to it at that time. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that lasted for a couple of weeks. Did you have anybody in your corner at that time? Was there anybody that was close to you that you could speak to, confide in, talk with? My grandma, Pam. So is that your mom's? Mom? It's on my dad's side. That's a, okay. So that's not the family you were living with? No. 
but you were close enough you could talk with her and yeah yeah well i i want to i didn't go to kentucky um my sister and my mom wouldn't answer the phone because they were in shame and guilt so i found eventually i found a place where and luckily they only you had to be up to 20 years old and they bought me a greyhound ticket home to indianapolis so that's what brought you back up here then. And um, I'd like to share something about that moment. Please. When I got out off of the Greyhound, mind you, I'm 98 pounds soaking wet. I'm dirty. My clothes don't match. My shoes don't even match. My family walked right past me and didn't even recognize me. And I had to go to them and say, hey, this is your daughter and sister. That had to be a slap in the face, not out of their disrespect, but the fact that you had changed and altered your appearance so much that they didn't recognize you. What are your thoughts on that moment, Heather? It was hard. But I also needed to see that my addiction had taken me to that place. So it kind of opened my eyes. I was going to ask you if that was reality smack, just like, you know, somebody's drowning. Sometimes you have to smack them to keep them from panicking. <laughs> and you were in that point of drowning with the drug. But that moment helped you see that you had reached a place you didn't want to be in. That's correct. I was detoxed once I got here. They, I was watched like a hawk. Um, nobody would leave me alone. And I got someone from Kentucky to wire me money. And my grandfather, Bob, um, took me to pick up the money. And anyway, I had got a burner phone or, you know, a track phone. And I left in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day um, to and go get ice cream. with him? No, I was, he took me to get the money, but he didn't realize I bought a phone. So I okay. said I was going to get ice cream and I never came back. Which I went you, back to Kentucky. You took off back to Kentucky, back to family again? Yes. Yes, okay, okay. How long were you there that time? I was there for about three months, and I was in and out of detox. And there was a warrant that was put out for my arrest. And I went down to Florida to turn myself in. But before I got there, those three months... I was put on a ventilator and machines to live nine times. Was that a result of drug usage? Was it was health, a, other health issues? It was a result of coming down from what I created, uh, you know, the drugs and all of that. And the last time that I was laying there, I asked God to give me one more chance, and um, he did. I got off of that bed, and here I am. So, let's just kind of play this back over real quick, okay? Yes. You were back and forth between Kentucky, Fort Lauderdale, Indiana, in and out of the struggle with the drugs, went through numerous detox attempts, and there you are after being on life support asking for one more chance, and you got the one more chance. Obviously, you wouldn't be across from me <laughs> today. Yeah, when I when they unplugged me, the doctor was standing there, and my mom was standing there with my funeral arrangements, asking me how I wanted to be buried. And the doctor told me that my organs from the damage that I had done were someone that was 40, and I was only 20 years old, and if I use it again, there's a good possibility I would die. And it sounds like there was a good possibility of it anyway, or at least the odds were not in your favor at that time. No. Okay, okay. Uh, what was your first step toward sobriety, toward being clean? So you've asked for that one more chance, and God said, here it is. What? Yeah. Tell us how you started to move forward, Heather. I went to jail and turned myself in on the warrant, and they put me in a program unit with 90 other females where I went to meetings and I learned about my disease of addiction. 
And from there, I was transported to a six-month Department of Correction facility on my charges for possession. And if I violated and didn't complete the program because I was in drug court, I was facing three years in prison. When I walked in that door that day, which is August 28, 2009, that's where my journey started. Let's hear about that. Tell us about that process and how that played out, please. <clears throat> I was scared. I would think so. You know, my family's 1,200 miles away. But when I went in there, the the residents didn't like, you know, hey, I'm so-and-so and make me feel welcome. It was the staff. They loved on me, and they, I got to get a shower, a real meal. That's where I learned um, yeah, I'm 20 years old. I could have chose to go another way. I didn't have to follow my parents' way. I turned 21 in rehab. So you started to reflect back, it sounds like, and you evidently came to the decision that you had not made a good one years earlier and you chose to follow your parents' footsteps instead of making a 180 and going the other way, correct? Yes. I know that makes it sound easy, and it couldn't have been. It wasn't easy, but I didn't use because I needed to fill a void or or I was different or wanted to fit in. I did it because I all I ever wanted was my parents to love me, and I didn't think if they couldn't love me that I was lovable. So I spent well, approximately nine years trying to commit suicide every day, asking God to take me. Folks, uh... Obviously, this is pretty raw. This is this is digging deep, and we appreciate Heather's willingness to do that because by her doing so, maybe you're going to look at your life in a different way. The struggles you've had, the battles that you've fought, those moments of suicidal ideations, uh, maybe even the attempts and the efforts or your losses or that emptiness within to where you just wanted to be love. And that's that's human nature. That's in our DNA. And when we're deprived of that, we oftentimes make the wrong choice. That doesn't excuse it. I simply hope it explains it and that you get what Heather's trying to say. So, Heather, you said you went through numerous thoughts of suicide, nine years worth, I think, is what you said. Uh, what, how did that play? Obviously, I, I shouldn't ask it that way. What were the efforts? I would just take a little more every day or, you know, mix this with that, like mix um, Xanax with cocaine and yeah. a little bit of crank and, you know, mix things together that would kill you, but it God had other plans. Yes, obviously, obviously. So it was just kind of, pardon the expression, suicide by drugs, yes? Yeah, because I, if my own parents couldn't love me, I didn't think that it was worth loving. Who else could if they didn't, right? Yeah. Nobody, yeah. Uh, we're sorry for that, but we, we get what you're saying. And so you managed to battle through that. And obviously you, you must have been having a lot of conversations with God, not just asking him to take you, but to help you get out of where you were to a better place. And obviously when he gave you that chance, you could rely, even if you didn't know the scripture at that point on that one, it says that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And I am of the belief there's not a thing we can do, not an effort we can accomplish, not a failure in our lives that can keep us from God's love. So even if you didn't know it, you had to start recognizing, I must matter or I'd be, I'd be dead already after the, you know, those near episodes. Is there any accuracy to that? Explain what you mean. Okay. With all that you were going through and you were hunting for that love, were you coming to recognize that there must be a God who loves me 
or a higher power that loves me, and I need to start moving in his direction instead of the direction I've been going. Does that make sense? Yes, I accepted Christ at five years old here at Anderson and Grace Baptist. And, you know, through the addiction, I had forgot about him, but he didn't forget about me. That's bottom line. I found him in a nasty jail cell, and I didn't realize the cat goes to jail, too. You know, (laughs) somebody else was in here, and that was was their line, God goes to jail. Uh, Sometimes we think it's got to be a coat and tie, a pretty dress, nice heels. (laughs) That's true. The right jewelry, the right look, this, that, in the right church, in the right pew, in the right moment. God doesn't do things because they're right. He does them because he has chosen to. And he chose you. So how has God helped you get to where you are today? And start to tell us about your recovery and how how different life is now where you are. I know you just had a special event in your life, but lead us up to that. And the changes that Heather sees in Heather, if she could go back to her 14-year-old self, what would you tell her? What would you tell the Heather, 14, 15 years old? That you matter, that you're loved, and not to go and follow the crowd or your family and try to break the generational curse. Mm, Big stuff. Yeah, yeah. So... Where are you today? What does your recovery look like, Heather? I still go to three to five meetings a week. Um, I sponsor women, take them through the 12 steps. I've Let's back up. How long have you been in recovery? 14 years. So 14 years, and you're still going to three to five meetings a week, yes? Yes. And I say that supportively. I don't say it with what's wrong with you in mind, okay? That's what it, whatever it takes is what we need to do. What do you find in the meetings that you attend? Why, why have those become a part of your life, your discipline, your recovery? My problem is alcohol and drugs and trauma. And I find the solution, whether I'm in an AA and NA meeting or a, an ABLBH meeting, I find the solution. When you say ABLBH, I'm going to explain that to the folks. That's a better life. Brianna's Hope, that's our parent group here at Faith in Your Recovery. <laughs> We'll talk some more about that in a minute because I know that Heather's highly involved with that and about to become more involved with it this weekend even. So go ahead now and and tell us more about the recovery journey and walk. For those who are out there who don't know what it looks like, and there are so many different paths to recovery we can't give you the one that'll work, but we can tell you what's worked for our folks that we interview here. So, Heather, tell them what's worked for you. Going to meetings, having a healthy support group, finding God or a higher power, serving others, helping. There's so much um, therapy You know, if you needed to go to a doctor to be seen or just have someone to talk to. So it's okay to say, I need help. Yeah, to reach out. Of course it is. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, Where do you see yourself today in all of that? Do you feel good about where you're at or the mountain's still so tall you can't see the top? And I'm not about to say you're at the top of it because when we think that, that's when we fall off the other side, okay? But can you see it from where you're at, Heather? I can today. Uh, Can we back up to 2019? Sure. Please tell us. I broke every bone in my left ankle. And I was unable to work for six months. And in that, I had to reach out and ask for help. And God always showed up and provided what I needed. So what kind of help did you need to ask for at that time? 
provisions or Provi- um provisions to help take care of my dog and my car um food support i love prayer i mean the list goes on and on where did you find that help heather i found it at northview and i found it at um new horizon methodist church where a better life Brianna's hope meeting is on monday nights so how long have you been involved there at new horizon over on 53rd Street, I believe it is, here in Anderson. How long have you been a part of that group? Almost four years. Four years, yeah, yeah. Tell them what's going to happen this weekend, this Saturday, Heather. Folks, we want you to hear this. We we believe at A Better Life, Brianna's Hope, that your story carries an impact, but so does your life. And when you mix it with a passion it creates good things. Go ahead, Heather. This Saturday, April 15th at 10 a.m. at Willow Place Women's Shelter in Madison County, there's going to be a closed meeting for the women that are in there in recovery. How many, what is your census? What's the numbers there as far Our as? Our census is 26. 26, okay, okay. Uh why there? Tell them what your career is and where you're at now. Well, I've been in the field ever since I got sober. I went when back. You say the field, you like, mean recovery field. Work with the recovery field in DOC. I've worked for DCF, ABA clinics. I now work for a homeless shelter, um, the Willow Place. I started October 31st as the community connector. And now you're going to be leading a chapter in there. For the 26 that are there, it's not a force thing, but those who choose to come out of that 26, that'll begin this Saturday, yes? That's correct, and I'm looking forward to it, and I know the women are. Why Why do you feel like you're qualified to do that, Heather? Because I've been there. I know where they are, and I was in places where people couldn't get out, and they brought meetings and recovery to me um i love the idea that we're we ablbh is going in for those who they need it they're in a safe place uh need it with good leadership we need to not forget even the scriptures tell us not forget the imprisoned i'm not trying to say they're chained in there they're locked in there but their world's pretty much in that building at this time. And if when they can't come to us, we've got to go to them. And that's always been an adage of ABLBH, that we want to go where the need is, and you're taking the need inside. Thank you for that. I'm sure that'll, uh, <laughs> that'll produce good fruit in the long run. And... Uh, You'll be able to share your story and hear a lot of others as well. Sometimes our, the things that we go through in life, we think God hates us or nobody loves us. But I'm learning it was never about me. It was about him. Yeah, that's big. And that makes a difference. And as you draw closer to him, you know, the fact becomes more clear all the time that it is about him. I was listening to her radio program with Charles Stanley preaching as I was coming over here. And those were almost his exact words. We don't go into ministry to serve others. We go in there to serve God. And we do that through our relationship with others. And he gains the fruit from that, the <laughs> the victory along with us. He shares it with us. So, yeah. That's big. Where are you at now, Heather, with your family? Uh, Your sister, are your parents still living? My mother passed away September 2016. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, I don't talk to my father anymore. I've tried. I've forgiven him and let him back in my life uh, almost 12 times, and he keeps hurting me. And there comes a point where a person, I've done what I can. There's a scripture that says, honor your father father and mother. 
because I don't talk to him, I'm still honoring him because I'm not doing what I'm not following what he led for us to do. Well, I think you said you've given him like 12 chances. Uh, there's 12 points on the honor scoreboard right there. And I know that's not the way it works, but you made that effort. It also says that we've got to flee from those things that will destroy us. And if he's not ready to to connect with you, you can't force him any more than you could have been forced into recovery before you were ready for recovery. So it's a matter of just hanging in there. You hope and pray. Maybe someday it'll come about. It's it's not my role. I'm I don't have the ultimate answer, but I believe you've made a legitimate effort, and to go any farther almost starts to enable him to be able to mistreat you to to put you aside or however that's playing out. So you made the honest effort. I say you stand in faith is what it says in Hebrews and absolutely. Um, my little sister is a big support of mine. There was a time we didn't talk because I had to cut all my family off, except my grandmother, because I had to take care of Heather. My little sisters and my nephews are back in my life. My nieces are, but my older sister, we don't talk because she's still out there. And if she hears this, I want her to know that I love her. And when she's ready, she knows where I'm at. That's That's good. That's good. Did you have a special event just recently in your life? Yes. I, I got married on March 25th, 2023. So you found somebody who loved you. Yes. didn't come in the form that, you know, you pray for. But it came the way God wanted it to be. And that's, that's even better. Uh, that doesn't diminish your prayers. But God's got a better answer than we do a question, all right? So, Heather, is there anything else you'd like to add to this for the folks? Uh, have we missed out on anything, or what I, would you like to say? I would like to talk about 2021. Please do. Tell the folks about that as you look back, cross your notes there. Folks, when we have someone in for an interview, they never know for sure what the questions are going to be. So you you come prepared with your story, but specific questions bring out specific thoughts. So Heather's going to share with you about her life in 2021. Go ahead, please. I never imagined that at 13 years sober I would hit rock bottom, but it happened. February 16, 2021, I was in a car accident. I was hit head on 45 miles an hour on impact, and I was cut out by the jaws of life. One more inch on impact in the motor and transmission would have crushed my body. March 31st, 2021, I was injured at the maximum security prison. May 2021, the work injury became crippling physically and mentally, and I lost the ability to function on every level. July 22nd, 2021, I was told by a doctor that based on my work injury that there was no hope for my physical abilities. That was at 11 a.m. July 22nd, 2021, I was in another car accident at 2.50. I was hit from behind. July 22nd, 2021, at 4 p.m., I was in the ER. But before I walked in, I called a pastor friend and explained, I don't think I'm walking out of here alive. As I checked in, my vitals were failing, and they had to bring me back to life. From July 22nd to 2021 to the morning of August 1st, I was tormented by a demon or an evil spirit. August 30th, 2021, I checked into a mental institution for seven days. September 10th, I had to get a life coach to learn how to function in life again. October 31st, 2021, I had to give up my apartment and could no longer pay rent and had to part with material things. During these events, no relapse took place by the grace of God in prayer.
June 8, 2022, I was released off all restrictions on the job that hindered me in 2021. September 29, 2022, I received the best gift within six months or less. The sky is the limit for my quality of life. Randy, I, um, I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk. I couldn't function. The people that you see on the street, that was me. And everybody gave up on me, and a lot of people didn't want anything to do with me. But that's not how my story ends. I kept fighting, and I kept doing what I needed to do because I didn't fight for 13 years just to lay there and let my diagnosis become who I am. Two and a half years, or no, two years of physical therapy, eight injections later, I can walk. I can work. I, I still have a traumatic brain injury that I'm working on. I'm the one that said this is not how my story ends, and I fought my way through it, and I never gave up on myself. So what is the end you're after? What is... How do you want your story to play out? We'll kind of wrap this interview up with that question. I just want to give back and be there for people and be a voice for the people that don't have one and show them the way to recovery, to a better life. You're in the middle of that with all that you're doing, just the things that I know, Heather, and there's so much more, I'm sure. And... I'm going to guess even at that point, let's say you accomplish each of those steps, you'll want to accomplish it with one more person and one more and one more because with the kind of drive you have with your willingness to ask for help that you had at your times of greatest need, you didn't come this far to only come this far. And uh, so... So thank you for being so vulnerable here today on uh, on our podcast, Faith in Your Recovery. And thank you for what you're doing in the recovery community. I'll close up with this. Title of our podcast, Faith in Your Recovery. What do those four words mean to Heather Matthews? Faith in your recovery. Well, first, I got to believe and I got to see people that are sober, live in life so that I can have faith and I can, someone that's been there and done the walk before me can lead the way for me and my recovery. And that's what you're wanting to do for others, yes? Correct. All right. Well, listen, Heather, thank you. We appreciate your willingness to share with us, to be so raw, to be surreal, and as I said earlier, so vulnerable. It's not easy stuff to relive some of these dark moments, but hopefully by your willingness to do that, it's going to bring light to somebody else's story. They'll be able to see that that dim light at the end of the tunnel and watch it become brighter and brighter. So folks, if you're out there listening, hang on. Don't give in to the battle. Keep believing. Give it one more effort. You never know. Your answer could be just around the next corner at the next amen after your prayer. It could be in the next person you meet showing you the way. Just hang on, hang in, God bless, and amen.